All right. Well, uh, welcome to Pipe Forward using Elixir and F Sharp together. My name is Brian Hunter. I'm a co founder at Graphene Software. We're a uh, startup. We're uh, doing edge analytics. And so, uh, what, what, what we're, we're pushing like kind of the queries upside down so that we're querying against mobile phones and IoT devices from the data center instead of the other way around. And so, uh, this topic is relevant to what I do. <laughs> so uh, I'm excited about this topic. I've been, been thinking about this for a long time. And one of my uh, sort of missions in here is to get you all excited about it too so uh, I'll have people to play with. And so we can all do this together. Um, so the ordinary world, I'm curious, uh, out of the folks in here, um, what's the normal language that you're using day to day? Is it C sharp? Okay. Okay, and then uh, F-sharp, okay, and Elixir, okay, awesome, awesome, a couple, great. Um, so the ordinary world for a lot of folks has been, and this is the ordinary world I came from, was, well, back in the 90s, it was C and Visual Basic, so these two opposite ends, you know, one was incredibly productive and the other one was, was fast and wouldn't just crash on you all the time. So it, you had to be pretty bad to actually be more crashy than C and that's what Visual Basic was. And so uh, it was not reliable but it was, you could knock stuff out really quickly and that was, that was cool. And then um, I started doing .NET development when, when, uh, in C Sharp when uh, it came along and that's been the path I was on up until 2007 when I ran into Erlang and then in 2009 ran into uh, F Sharp and then, you know, as Elixir came on, ran into it. And so one of the things I've realized that you hear these sort of language wars and um, th that folks get really excited about, and a lot of times it's about arguing, like, uh, I like my hammer more than this hammer. And it's all about a bunch of hammers because they all do exactly the same thing and you, they're kind of indistinguishable. And so the arguing about which is better is a little silly. So it's really nice if you start thinking about your toolbox and you can have tools that are actually quite different uh, to put in the box. And I think that F Sharp and Elixir <laughs> fit the bill here. And so here we all are on our call to adventure here. So Awesome Elixir and awesome F Sharp. Uh, this is kind of derived off the GitHub pages you see that have the list of libraries, the awesome Elixir and awesome F Sharp. But it applies to both these languages. Some of the things I see, like awesome JavaScript, and you know, uh, I, you know, it's, I, it should be a 404. But it, you know, but here we have uh, two languages that really are awesome. Uh, I can't spend a whole lot of time or I'll run out of my hour uh, talking about the basics of Elixir, but if there's something that I run across that you're like, what are you talking about? I don't have a clue what that is. Stop me, okay? And then another thing you can do is go here to Vimeo and I uh, gave a talk last June called What Every Node.js Developer Needs to Know About Elixir. But primarily it's a really good introduction to Elixir. Uh, in it, you just picked a context of Node people because I think that they're they're in need of salvation. <laughs> they're in need of, a, of, a, of a, an escape hatch. And so this talk, uh, I th I'm really proud of, of the job it did on this intro to Elixir there. So uh, that would be one to follow up on. And this idea of why functional programming, for me anyway, is based on lean manufacturing. So the Toyota production system is really the core of why I got into functional programming. And it's because of this, these sort of safeties that are, uh, that are in the language, the, the mistakes you can't make because of the languages. And this applies across all the functional languages. They have quite different approaches on how they, they hit this goal, but I think those really line up. And so if you, if you enjoyed this, uh, please go out and check out this talk. Uh, it's another one I, uh, that I'm really happy with the way it turned out. All right, so uh, rather than me give a big list of what I think about uh, uh, Elixir and F-sharp, uh, Stackshare, I think they, they nailed it here. I mean, the, the community nailed it. And so we've got uh, Elixir is this dynamic functional language designed for building scalable and maintainable applications. And I can't think of a better sort of tag than that. And the same thing over on the F-sharp side, strongly typed functional first programming language for writing simple code to solve complex problems. So you can see you've got you don't have two hammers there. You've got like a hammer and a saw. So if you need to take one board and turn it into two boards, you could use a hammer to do that, but it's probably better to take a saw to do that. And so we start seeing that we've got this differentiation here. Uh, concurrency uh, is the top, top reason to look at Elixir. Uh, and we see uh, 
all sorts of good reasons over on the F-sharp side as well. But we'll hop in and look at some of the quotes on here. So with Elixir, uh, or with F-sharp, there's a transition. You, you've got this hybrid language where it's functional first, but you can do OO stuff if you really, you know, if, it, if it's, you can keep the training wheels on for a while if it's your first go on this. Um, it is terse, concise, uh, really, really tight language where your code bases will collapse and shrink. Um, you get your .NET interoperability, which we're not going to get over on the Elixir side, obviously, because it's a totally different VM. And uh, the, the, the one at the bottom, the support in Xamarin, is really interesting. This applies to us at Graphene because we, again, we're targeting mobile devices, and so you don't have a lot of functional... You have some functional choices, but the obvious one is using uh, F-sharp in Xamarin to target mobile devices. Um, the, the Elixir things, the things that people point out ends up being about dev joy. Uh, so uh, a lot, you know, there's these things that come from the Erlang VM, this stunning thing, this operating system, the Erlang VM, that gives you all sorts of things you just can't get in other languages. But a, a kind of a key core bit is uh, what was added on Elixir on top of the Erlang VM. And a lot of that has to do with developer joy and productivity and making, uh, taking a, a language that was created in 86, Erlang, and bringing it into, uh, making it really modern. And so uh, the, 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 uh, the, this is one of the things I want to talk about towards the end is about how we can sort of steal each other's culture. Not just how do we make these languages talk, but how do we, how do we borrow the best things from the other culture? How do we take the tools that work really well, the things that can be stolen, so some things can't be, some things can be. So that'll be kind of the thread that we look at here. So just to, just to start off just what functional programming is, because these are both very functional languages. Um, not pure, but, but they're, you know, they're, not, they're not just sort of you know, playing. It's not a play date. It's, they're really functional languages. And so uh, A goes to B is what we see here. So this would be another way of uh, kind of a bigger word for this would be referential transparency. But where you have arguments come in and you have outputs go out, and that's it. The, the, the output is only dependent on the input. You're not depending on, like, what you variable you set on your class constructor or what happened two method calls ago and you wiggle state around inside of your class. And so uh, this makes a sane, sane place to be. And we can, we, we can get into the weeds a little bit with, uh, with Elixir, but not so much. We can reach out to the outside world talk to databases and things. And of course, that is, you know, you can depend on things like that. And so you can break, you can violate that when you're doing I.O. Uh, with F-sharp, you can violate it when you touch C-sharp and you touch the .NET, you know, so that it's a, this is, F-sharp, there are things that are more treacherous in F-sharp than they are in, in Elixir and then vice versa, really. Uh, this is, a, again, a series of trades. Mutability, uh, Elixir is just nailed in. You can't change things. Uh, it looks like you can, and it's again a dev joy thing. You, there's a, a shadowing is basically what you have, but uh, uh, rebinding, and, uh, but, but you don't have mutation. Uh, variables aren't being replaced in Elixir. It can't be done. F sharp, you can do it, but you have to do the walk of shame by tagging with mutable uh, on it. And so it's it's good that it makes it hard and embarrassing. You know, it makes it embarrassing to mutate. But we know that this is really important as far as building systems that can scale uh, and you can maintain. So another bit here is code is data. We can take code and serialize it out. We can look at code. We can modify the code as if it were data and then rewrite the code and rerun that new code. And so this is a common thing in, in FP, and these are, you know, these, these are big in the languages we're talking about. Um, then data without code. So the idea of a class is just such an abomination because you, you have this, again, you set the table with all your state, and then everyone can wiggle with these method calls, and a few method calls in, you have no idea how you got the current state you're in. You don't know, so you have to have all these guards and checks. Functional languages, we tend to have data structures, and we push those data structures, A goes to B, again. They come into the function, and then the, some new value comes out of the right side. We transform. We're not actually modifying the thing in place, we're just coming up with a different output on the right side. And so 
that ends up creating this funny thing of up is down. Uh, and, and I'll describe that with the pipeline operator. <clears throat> and so both languages have the pipeline, and it's not that they both... Uh, Jose, when he created uh, Elixir, he looked and he saw all the great things that every other language did, and he stole them. And, and so one that came from F-sharp was the, was the pipe operator. It actually ha had a little bit different of a, a symbol before, but it you know, normalized on basically F-sharps because it's, you know, it looks great. It's, it's neat. And so um, there's one slight difference, and Elixir, the pipe line operator, uh, basically takes the, f the value from the previous function and shoves it in as the argument of the next function. And F-sharp, it's just the opposite. It goes as the last argument of the following function. But let's describe what we mean here. So if we have a transform, and we're wanting to say, drink your Ovaltine, it's our input string, and we're going to transform this into uh, a string that has tacos on each side. So we're going to wrap it in tacos, and we're going to uppercase it all, and we're going to put uh, snake uh, instead of spaces. And so we could transform that like this. We could yell, wrap, Snake space, drink your Ovaltine, comma taco, close, close, and you know it's kind of horrible, right? You know that that you know, this is not a lot of stuff going on. It's ugly, but this is what happens when you're not, you know, grabbing variables and mutating them in place. Uh, you, you end up having this sort of chaining of functions, and so it can be kind of hideous. So this is where the the pipe operator comes in in both cases, and so th this becomes very readable and clean, and so it gets us out of that nasty spot at the top. So. We, both communities, there's just an incredible amount of love that you see. Like, uh, you see people grumbling about their tools and their languages. The people in the Elixir community and the F-sharp community, you don't hear so much of that. They're out there just evangelizing. They're out there just, you know, just making everyone else feel rotten that they're not doing F-sharp and Elixir. And that's, that's a good thing. That's another reason to look at both of them. They're both exciting in that way. And my... Uh, this is my, my brother. Uh, he's actually my older brother, even though he looks, uh, he's nine years older than me, and he looks like nine years younger than me. But anyway, uh, he, he got me into programming, but he's sort of stuck in this, still in that C-sharp land, and he hasn't been able to move around uh, and get out of it yet. And so I kind of look at him as, uh, as the canary of like, you know, where are things, you know, what's the environment like? And so he, he was asking about this talk, and he, you know, I have a few questions from him in here. He's like, uh, which language you'd use for each tier. And that just sort of tells you even the context he's coming from. It's like this, this sort of Redmond standard, you know, tiered architecture kind of view. And um, so we, we'll talk about that, but we can kind of pick the pieces and kind of glue them together wherever. And we will be gluing them in different directions. Uh, and, you know, what we can, we can do to talk to the databases. And so these are, again, we need to be able to do this from every component if we need to, because databases is just like any other kind of I.O. Um, and so you hear these questions, and there's always this concern of, like, can I move forward into this? Uh, you know, you can see that hesitation, like, will I be able to actually talk to databases? Will I be able to, to write UIs? Will I be able to do this? And then you get it from, the, uh, from, like, at companies, where you have this sort of forbidden, you can't. You know, we can't use FP here. We're, we are, we're a C-sharp shop or whatever. And... The, it's sort of a toxic place, and it, it becomes... The, the thing that's toxic about that, I want you to be able to try to resist that about the polyglot of being able to use F-sharp and Elixir together, because it's just a different degree of that. If you're at your shop and you're able to use F-sharp, that's brilliant. If you're able to use Elixir, that's brilliant. But you need to push and be able to you know, use the right tool for the job, and, uh, and if you don't, you know, you know get out. Because, <laughs> uh, you know, the thing that, about what happens with these communities is the best of the, F or the, best of the C Sharp developers become F Sharp programmers. The best, the best C Sharp people become F Sharp people. And uh, people that were the best in other stacks like Ruby or Node move over to Elixir. And that's a migration we're seeing. Erlang people, you know, they generally stay Erlang people. I'm one of the few Erlang people that became an Elixir programmer, but uh, uh, it, that seems to be a migration. So let's, let's see uh, who we have to thank here. So on the left, we have uh, Jose Valim, and on the right, we have Don Syme. And I think that they both did a pretty, you know, pretty remarkable things. And so um, you had this fellow, the sort of transformation that they took 
from what they built on. Uh, so Elixir is built on the Erlang VM, this crusty, you know, language that the world depends on, but everyone, but no one programs in it. There are no Erlang developers. Like, uh, you know, uh, you look around, and in, in, in Nashville, I was uh, standing next to this other guy that was an Erlang programmer, and someone pointed and said, hey, look, it's Erlang user group, and because uh, that was all that was in town, you know, in the whole city of Nashville, there were two of us, and it was actually correct. There were only two Erlang developers. And um, so went from that and brought in this, this thing where you, you have this language that's moving towards being a top 10 language. It's like, a, you know, it's going to be one of the mainstream languages for the next 15 years in the same way that uh, you could say that Ruby, or that uh, VB was the Ruby of the 90s, and you could basically say that Elixir is the Ruby of the next 15 years. And in this way, it's like this very productive place where a lot of people move. Um, and so that's happening right now. And that was built on top of this crusty kind of land. On the Don Syme side, you've got, think about Microsoft when, when F-sharp came about. You've got this, this environment where it was the most depressing thing ever. I'd been a Microsoft developer my whole life, and, and I, everyone was fleeing. They were jumping out, and I, I, just, I was starting to hate programming, you know? And, and, and in the middle of this dark, dark time when it's like the company is lost, they're going to go out of business, um, Don Syme is off doing this brilliant work. And, and he's got something that I think is one of the things that the company should be the most proud of that they've done. Uh, it's not, <laughs> but it should be. They should be more proud of it than, than anything else they have running. But, uh, so, but why together? So there was a conversation um, on, uh, this is in 2010, on uh, uh, InfoQ, there's an interview, actually there was also uh, Scala in there, but I went ahead and sort of removed it because we don't want to talk about Scala today. Um, where uh, they're talking, you know, it was just an interview and the conversation about Inrop kept coming up over and over. And it was sort of like this demon haunted kind of part of the, the interview. You know, how they, they were both, you know, everyone was focused on this. But this is in 2010 and it was the, f I was also, this is the first time I uh, was in the middle of a large Erlang project. I picked up the language in 2007 and be, played with it more or less for three years, but I was on a big project, it was a banking, comp uh, banking project, uh, lots of transactions, and uh, they were needing help scaling their C-sharp. And so uh, I saw this at the time and it really rang, and, and that's actually why I guess this talk got created, you know, you know seven years later, <laughs> and uh, six years later. But um, in it, um, Joe says, you know, how should we talk to each other? Let's agree on how we talk to each other. And it's, it's funny because to have a language, it, it, it's, not, it's not automatic and it's not easy and it's not, the, the obvious ways are, it feels awkward, really. The interop is, was between Erlang and C-sharp was always awkward back in those days. And I, I have to say it's about the same now. Um, which is weird because Erlang connects everything. So at Ericsson, um, you had this language that was built for fault tolerance, concurrency, and distribution, and now you over half of the world's mobile traffic goes through Erlang. So everything is connected. I mean, right now, if I send an email to, to Thomas back there, it's going through Erlang. <laughs> if, I, if I call home, it's, it's going through Erlang. Everything is you know, going through this language, so obviously it connects well. But why don't we see it connecting with the .NET ecosystem? And it, I think it has more to do with cultural heritage <laughs> than, than, than other things. And so we'll, we'll talk about that a bit. Um, just don't think we've figured out how to make components connect. So in this conversation, if you look this up, it's, it's interesting because uh, Don, he's thinking, well, they do connect. You know, we use these industry standards to connect. And Joe is actually wanting something a little bit deeper. And uh, he's wanting this idea of being able to pass lambdas across from one side to the other and be able to, like S expressions he's talking about, and basically having, you know, where you've got your abstract syntax trees and you're passing back and forth. And he's wanting to have this sort of protocol level of having languages that are good languages that play by certain rules to be able to, to do more interesting things than XML, you know. And um, so, so let's go into our special world here. <laughs> So we've got different VMs, type systems, concurrency models, different cultural heritage. Uh, we, we, 
this we saw, uh, this will start coming up with that answer of like, which one do you pick for what kind of problem? And so and these are based off of this top level thing of the static and dynamic. Um, I think F sharp is really good when you're dealing with complex things. Like you've got a domain object, you've got business rules, you've got like these like watchmaking kind of complex things. And uh, Elixir really is good if the problem isn't so much about the thing, but it's about the orchestration of all the things. If you have millions of things that are interacting and in different timelines and all that, I don't know of a better place to be than on, on Elixir uh, for that sort of problem. Uh, and so uh, F Sharp focused on raw throughput and performance. Uh, on the Elixir side, about low latency, about having deterministic scheduling. Uh, we have correctness on day one is an F-sharp goal. So when you compile this static type system, it's its most valuable the minute the compile is finished. <laughs> and every minute you get away from compilation time, the static type system is not really helping you off in the future so much, and eventually you, know, you end up having sort of like code rot kinds of problems or DLL hell. I think, think you know, the DLL that's been, it's, checked into source control, it's been there for 10 years and you don't have the source to build it and, and how are you ever going to be able to use this thing again? And uh, that, that kind of problem that probably everyone has been in. And that's what you have with, you can have with static type systems. On uh, this other side, we can do hot code loading. Uh, we can have a system running, even if we release with bugs, you have supervision trees, if something dies, you can restart it, bring it back up. Um, and and if it dies again because there's truly a bug, that one part of the system fails, even though the rest of the system runs. And so you could have a system that part of it has crashed, but at the end of the year, you've had a, a close to 100% uptime because the majority of the system ran and you just had a part of it that failed and the developers fixed the bug. You do a hot code loading to that one part, bring it back up, and, it, you know, and you're running without bringing the rest of the system down, which is powerful. And then this cultural heritage. So with Microsoft, you move from this sort of crusty enterprise company and F-sharp has a sort of STEM mindset, like the science, technology, engineering, and math, or even maybe even STEAM, like the science, technology, engineering, art, and math, because there's this real creative side, this nerdy creative thing that happens on the F-sharp side, and th this culture is really important as far as how we use these things together as well. On the uh, Elixir side, you had crusty engineers at Ericsson that yield and turn into like these sort of Ruby... Dev joy, you know, hug each other, you know, functional programmers, which is kind of an interesting thing. Um, so, let's about using together in the shared ecosystem. So we we don't like this option at the top left. We don't like just being uh, just C sharp, and we also have this option next to it of F sharp or Elixir. And you know, that's that's not so bad. You know, you get to pick one of those. That's not bad, and that's where a lot of us are. Uh, but, you know, if we look to this third box about the F-sharp and Elixir both in the same company, that's, that's a bit better. We get into interesting territory down here. On, uh, when we're over here on our uh, F-sharp touching right against Elixir, this is what we're going to be doing like interop, and we're going to be uh, sending messages back and forth, and we're going to be driving one from the other. And then this box in the middle uh, is kind of what Joe is talking about. It's like where we... Where where we can make the things hook up a little bit better in an elegant way. Now, if that goes too far, you, there's some sort of weird cell division thing that goes over here, and this thing at the right, and it can get really creepy. You know, we can have uh, we can this kind of unholy thing that happens whenever two things are kind of closer than they should be. And, and so we, we don't want that, right? We, we want to be in this place... Um, like one of those, the middle four, right? The, the, the three, uh, the, really the, the bottom two on the left here are, are, are good spots. So we're going to insert just a bit of, uh, of uh, current events. Uh, we had our Trump-Putin uh, thing, but we've got a little bit more of current events here. So there's a, a blog post that is uh, kind of raged, uh, uh, on Twitter for the last week or so. And so Uncle Bob, um, uh, he has this post about the dark path. And then we look over and we have this fellow, uh, uh, Philip Wadler, that uh, is all about types. And Uncle Bob's over here all about tests. 
And Uncle Bob is all upset about how, uh, how he was talking about two languages, really. And so, uh, so Swift is one of the ones he was talking about, and he was banging on it because it was forcing him to be correct instead of him having discipline himself. And so you have Wadler over here with propositions and types. So this is a thing to Google here. Um, there's a brilliant talk that he gave at Strange Loop uh, called Propositions as Types. Uh, and it will, if you've ever s- sort of felt like, uh, I don't really know what all these people are talking about about type systems, this is the talk to ground you. It's, it's actually stunning. Uh, and over here he's basically saying if you... Um, if you don't write tests and if you count on your tools to protect you from problems and just you know, quit your job, you know, was the, the sort of the take in there. And actually that line was in there. You need to quit your job and quit being a programmer. And a lot of people, this was the part that people were really disgusted by. Um, and so we bring up another character in here. We got John Hughes, an inventor of Quick Check. And so, uh, so quick check, uh, you know, in a talk uh, that John Hughes gave at NDC Oslo a couple of years ago called uh, 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 Testing Your Car with Erlang, uh, um, he's, he's talking about quick check, and he, one of his statements in there was like, if you're writing unit tests, you're human, and you're writing unit tests, you're really wasting your time, which is completely opposed on this side over here. And so it's interesting you have these people that are really smart and have all helped a lot of people and you've got such disagreement here. And we'll add one more to the mix. We have Edwin Brady here. Uh, and so he brings uh, like one more dimension to the conversation about with dependent types, behavior can be specified precisely in the type. And this is one of the things that uh, Uncle Bob was complaining about, about type systems, is that you know, they couldn't replace tests. Well, in this case with Idris, you sort of have the type system replacing the need for tests in certain cases. You, so with, with this idea of dependent types, if you're not familiar, is uh, you can, so you could have a type checker check in most languages and say, oh, this list or this function is going to take two lists, and we can guarantee that the lists are both full of ints. So that's good. But what if your code needs both those lists to be the same length? Well, that's kind of weird, right? You're going to have to write a test for that. Or you're going to have to do something like Well, with dependent types, you can have that cooked in to the type signature, basically where the guard that basically keeps that from happening, you wouldn't get a compilation if, you did, if the lists weren't the same length. And, uh, so that's it's kind, of, kind of stunning what's going on there. So you have this sort of union of all these different ideas and these different ways of looking at this problem of tests and types, which is, of course, the big gap between Elixir and F-sharp. And at the NDC conferences, it's really been a treat to have this mix of Elixir developers and, and Erlang developers on, along with F-sharp and Haskell people, because this is the conversation about types or tests. And this is one of the places where, as you're using these in the shop, culturally, will be the biggest sort of thing. And of course, to be fair, Uncle Bob is a functional programmer as well. He's a closure programmer. Uh, and so he's over uh, using this dynamic language on the JVM. So. And we're back to that conversation about the, the, you know, do we want a bunch of hammers? Uh, the the one thing I would say is the, the powerful part about functional programming is, is is about the do not require constant diligence. When our tools, you know, when they require that, it puts us in a rotten spot. Uh, and the tool vendors should be ashamed. And, and this is a case, Uncle Bob's just wrong in the post because the tools should protect you from everything a tool can protect you from. Uh, you know, they don't need to gum you up, and it's, maybe they did a poor implementation of it, it just needs to be a better language. But the, the, the problem wasn't that it protected you from making mistakes, it was that it was written, it was executed poorly in the, in the language design. So uh, I think that would be the, the thing to beat instead of... All right, how do we make them work together? So protocols, interrupts, and gaps. We're going to poke around and look at... Uh, so we've got our three, uh, four different kinds of adapters here. Uh, the one on the right is not safe, obviously, uh, because it doesn't have a ground wire. Now it's safe. So. Alan Kay, <clears throat> absolutely brilliant. Everything he's ever said, you can just listen to over and over. Uh, but um, he's basically wagging his finger at what happened with OO. And you know, it's like you got it wrong. You know, the idea was about messaging. It wasn't about objects, it was about messaging. 
And you know, this model of cell, this biological cells was the model he had in mind. And the, the part between is what he thought was interesting. The key is making great and growable systems is much more to, uh, uh, to design how its modules communicate rather than what their internal properties and behavior should be. And so he's saying this is actually the primary bit of importance where it always becomes sort of the afterthought in languages. And so it's a place for us to, I think, to maybe level up our tools. And uh, we've got a good playground here with Elixir and F-sharp to, to try to do that. <clears throat> so what is it when we stitch things together? So we've got an app and an app. So this could be, you know, uh, Elixir and F-sharp. So uh, there's the hexagonal architecture idea of the ports where you can have things coming out, but we've got that stuck on there. But you can think of the area where we're going to talk to the outside world in our application. You can think of it in DD terms. DDD terms is like the bounded context or the anti-corruption layer, the however you want to think about that interface to the world. And you want to be able to play idiomatic inside of that, and you want to be able to play in some sort of um, some, some, you're not necessarily worried about the idioms inside of that box, but you don't want to deal inside of that box. You want the box to be written, written once and there for you and handle the mapping back and forth. That mapping is going to, you know, you're going to have your pipe going between the two objects. <clears throat> and unless you're talking about, you know, .NET and .NET, you're going to have some serialization involved. Or even if you have .NET and .NET, but you, maybe you're worried about like the versioning of types and you don't want to have binary compatibility between things. Uh, so you're going to have this serialization up and down. And <clears throat> if we have a network involved, you've got all sorts of crazy in there uh, that we're going to have to deal with. And we're going to have to think about like all of the weirdness that could happen and what failure means on that wire. <clears throat> all right, so let's hop into some demos now. Uh, so I'm going to show one here. <clears throat> These just take different approaches. Uh, uh, we're going to look at different demos that are just looking at the problem from, from different sides. Okay, so I put together this thing called uh, F sharp X. Uh, and so it's using... Um, it's using the idea of Erlang ports. Uh, to do what it's going to do here. And so if you were curious about the mechanism, this is it. Uh, so let's go back in here. <clears throat> so here we're going to say, um, we're going to spawn one of these uh, a process up. So we're in Elixir, the Elixir shell here. And I'm going to store off this process ID that's going to come back from this thing. Okay. And from there, I can start doing interesting things. I can say F. Uh, I can say, uh, and so pass in my first argument here. Okay, so our result came back from uh, F sharp over here. So we're in the middle of our Elixir REPL, and we made math happen over on F sharp, which is nice. You know, and it's just kind of nice to, right in the middle of the REPL to be able to do, uh, to do things like this. And so I'll pull a few uh, just off the clipboard so um, you don't have to watch me type. And so our Erlang port is just mapping up uh, so we basically just have an instance of F# -sharp interactive on Mac or FSI if you're on Windows, and we're just using ports to talk back and forth between the two. And so there's nothing really uh, crazy about that. And if, you know, in one way it seems a little hokey, but the the implementation here is possibly a, a little hokey, uh, but the idea is pretty powerful because. I, what we're going to do a lot of times, and this, this ties in with systems that I've built where I am doing interop uh, between the two. Uh, a common thing is I have Erlang or Elixir as a supervisor. It's, I'm distributing work. I've got a series of nodes, different servers out there. They're spun up, running 
they all have Erlang nodes running on them, and they're communicating, however. They're handling the communication because Erlang is amazing at routing and that distributed bits and handling lots of things. Okay, it's not necessarily great at some of the computation. The libraries aren't there to do graphic bits or video bits or whatever, and so a lot of times you shell off and do things. But this is a really nice way of doing this. The, there's one part that's missing, and that's that we're coming back with strings here uh, off of our, our print. But, uh, but just not to you know, beat it too much, but uh, uh, you know, so I think that's kind of neat. And we can do, oh, ah, <laughs> running away here. And so we have opened up a window into uh, to, to something else, and that's that we can start to uh, tie into infrastructure. And so we've just tied in here, and we're going to pull back from uh, uh, F# -sharp type provider, and we're calling that from the Elixir side. Now, this is, a f this is kind of the, the, the prototype of, of this component, uh, this F sharp X. The thing what we need to do next with it is we need to return types. And we need to be dealing with where we can send types that go through a mapping and we get types back. And at that point, we've actually got something. You know, we've got something that's a, not a bad story, really, because you're, if you're talking about orchestration on the same machine and you're going to use Erlang to distribute across a cluster, and, uh, and you're basically doing worker back and forth. That's, you know, that's what we need right there. And that's what we got. All right, so that's, that's one take on this problem. <clears throat> let's see. Let's look at another, uh, another angle of that. And And this is really just our same problem. but in reverse. So we're again just, this instead of using an Erlang port, obviously, because Erlang ports aren't a thing <laughs> on the side, we're, uh, we're using uh, process. And so we've got this kind of ugly code up here, but uh, th this is the sort of thing you'd want to wrap up and again, become the template for how we, we marshal our, our bits back and how we're gonna you know, or do our good work. Yeah, uh, what did I just do? Oh, <laughs> yeah. Okay, so here we are inside of FSI, and we have this text coming back about the interactive Elixir shell, which is kind of nutty. So there's one thing that tooling-wise already that we're seeing. It's much easier over on the F-sharp side of tooling of being able to send commands. I had that awkward copy-paste thing that I was having to do there. F-sharp has had this thing from the beginning of being able to, uh, whatever set of tools to be able to send it interactive. This is a thing that Elixir needs to steal. Uh, so this is, the kind of, this is the kind of space. It's not like we need the nut that goes on this bolt kind of thing. It's like we're in this experience of working with these tools together. How can we borrow? How can we borrow? So we uh, sorted a list of numbers. So this is a pretty interesting thing. So over on the, uh, this is another thing that needs to be stolen. So I just said, uh, I don't know if you saw the line, but I told it to H enum. So this is to say help, is what I'm saying. Uh, I'm saying, give me the help for the enum module. And so uh, we get this nice in REPL documentation back about enum. It says, provides a set of algorithms that enumerate over uh, enumerables according to the enumerable protocol, gives examples of usage, and so on. That needs to be stolen. This needs to be inside of F Sharp. We need to be able to inside, in F Sharp Interactive to be able to get help on any of the things that we're working with. It needs to be there. Okay, and so that's enough of that one. If anyone has any questions about things, don't let me run past uh, if, if something's not clear what we're actually doing. Uh, Okay, let's look at, uh, let's go to uh, 
do some rest, because this is one of uh, Don's answers to Joe uh, as far as like how you should communicate. And so he mentioned rest in that talk, and so I went ahead and <clears throat> knocked together a little bit of a, a thing here for us to... Uh, All right. Uh, okay, and so what we're going to do here is we're going to spin up a, uh, a, a Phoenix application. So if you want to learn more about Phoenix, then Sonny is uh, right there, the fellow with the beard, and he'll be talking about uh, the Phoenix framework. He's actually one of the core contributors to the Phoenix framework, which is Elixir's uh, web framework. All right, so we have our, uh, our Phoenix application running, serving up uh, our REST goodies. And so let's talk to that from F Sharp, why don't we? Let's see what this thing has to offer us. Okay, we're going to have some F-sharp here. Uh, we're just going to basically do just normal rest, and we're going to be talking back and forth. Uh, we're going to get to JSON, from JSON. We're going to have a function that gives us a list of orders that goes off and requests uh, off of that URL uh, that we had here, the localhost 4002 orders. And uh, it's going to list our orders, and then we have one that's going to take an order. Okay, so... Let me look at, uh, let's make, so we can actually see that code instead of hiding it all. So, so pretty standard, you know, just HTTP stuff here. Uh, and so there's nothing remarkable about what we're doing here uh, other than we've got, uh, you know, our squid tacos from Scott and our fish tacos from Don. And, and Matthias is going to order a goat, seven goat tacos. And so we've just, you know, we're communicating here between uh, F Sharp and Elixir again. And this is the way that Don would recommend. And it's, we can do this in a nice tight way. And we're all good there. So no big surprises. Okay, this one is kind of fun. So let's go... Uh, Let's spin up uh, another Phoenix server that's over in this thing called Feeble. But let's look at Feeble. So Feeble, we're looking at our uh, Phoenix application here in this code. Uh, so we see that we've got our mix exs file. This kind of tells you you're at the root level of an Elixir project. <clears throat> and this is uh, a Phoenix web application that we're looking at. And it has all of its you know, channels and controllers and templates and views and all this stuff, but it has this unexpected folder in there called Fable. And so Fable uh, is uh, an F-sharp to JavaScript transpiler. And so we can serve this right out of Phoenix. Uh, so we can do our good work inside of uh, F-sharp here instead of having to write god-awful JavaScript. And, uh, and we can host that up inside of our... So we're looking at, uh, oh. so this application that we're going to look at is one that's just out on, uh, uh, on GitHub under Fable. So let's go and look at the, uh, what, what that looks like. Okay. So we have, uh, so we have Phoenix serving up, and then we have this canvas that's being drawn by F Sharp here. Uh, and here's our code for the canvas. It's just basically filling rectangles. You see, we've got two rectangles, and why don't we uh, why don't we uncomment this one? Save that, and then. CD, uh, 
Okay, so we saved our code off where we added that extra one in there, and we'll just say fable right here. So it's going to compile it and then basically poke it in the right place inside of our Phoenix application so that we serve it up and then we get our, our nice, you know, three boxes there. <clears throat> and this is another one in the same uh, thing of where we're playing Pac-Man, you know, <laughs> which is pretty cool. All right. Let's, uh... Sorry, is that... Oh. The, the, the web page served by Phoenix is just serving you JavaScript. It really is just serving you JavaScript at that point, yeah, because it's being kicked out, but we're, you know, we're all in the same project together, and we're handling the automatically pushing it out, and, and, and all the, the automatically updating, and, and all that, and that's handled by Phoenix, but we're kind of in, we're... Another thing is about the tooling. This is nice. So we're in Ionite here. Or, well, no, we're, well, we're in Ionite on the F-sharp side, but we're in Visual Studio Code. You could do the same thing in Atom. We've got the same tool here, and we're editing this F-sharp code, and we're editing this Elixir code, and it's pretty f seamless as we're moving back and forth. So we're not far from this really nice place. I mean, when, when I started trying to make this interop stuff work, like, everyone in Erlang was all Emacs. <laughs> And so I had to learn Emacs, you know, I like, I, I want those, I want those months back, you know, uh, and I, like the amount of time I wasted poking around at Emacs D files is just stunning. I made a New Year's resolution a couple years back where I would not allow myself to use Emacs for a whole year because it's burning weeks of playing, you know, just tweaking. And so uh, here, I, you know, I'm not tempted to edit Visual Studio Code. I'm not tempted to edit Atom because it's JavaScript. You know, I'm not going to touch that. And so it's, uh, so I can get out of the business of monkeying around with the tools, and, but this is all, this is seamless, the way that we're able to use these together, even in the same project uh, structure. You know, we had our just fable down below it, and it played nice with Phoenix, which is really good. Now, there's a bit of work that needs to be done on there, uh, and this is going to require someone to do some JavaScript work, as there really needs to be a brunch plug-in that handles Fable. There's one uh, that handles uh, Elm, and so there are a lot of people using Elm inside of Phoenix applications for that very reason. And so that's just a little bit of work that someone that doesn't mind JavaScript could actually do and, and do really great, great things for the community. So, um, where, where did you, uh, how would you categorize that example, going back to your earlier slide when you had it? Yeah, so, yeah. Um, yeah, that's a funny one. I mean, I don't, I don't know. I mean, it's like you're, you're using them both together. You're targeting the front end with, uh, with, with F sharp. Uh, you're the back end. You're serving it up with Phoenix Elixir. Uh, you could have web uh, then the channels basically tying the front to the back, where the 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 JavaScript that's getting emitted could be talking back to phoenix and doing web sockets and so you could have the interplay happening between the client and the server but i guess the, the, the part of the idea is that you've got this correctness so javascript is a terrible place to write code uh you know there ui is a terrible pl place to write code right and so we've got this place where we've got correctness and we're able to push this you know able to write this thing in f sharp in this nice language that's concise and we can make sense of and all this and we don't have to know all the pitfalls because it, you know, it won't compile. <laughs> like, I, you know, I, I know that. Like, every time I have my pitfalls, well, I don't compile. Here, you know, that's something you want instead of just like, you know, whatevs, I'm going to shove it down to the pipe and it's on someone's browser and it's going to crash, you know. Uh, so uh, I, I, maybe it's the one where they kind of bump up against each other. <laughs> it's, not, it's, not, it's definitely not the Donald Trump one. Uh, uh. <clears throat> All right. Uh, and let's see, how close are we? Okay, so we're not, we have some time. Good, good. Okay, so uh, let's look at uh, Phoenix channels. And this is where, uh, so let me describe uh, Phoenix channels. Uh, Sonny will be talking about this some in his, in his Phoenix talk a bit later. But this is where we have our web server running in Elixir. And whatever thing is connected to it, we want not the communication just to be like, hey, send me a request, and then I'll, I'll send you some response, and we'll play it that way. We're going to be two-way communication. And so it's a, it wraps on top of web sockets, or the implementation could be replaced, and it could be long polling. It could be uh, chunked response. It could be, you know, whatever, because there's, a, there's a, an interface there. This, this protocol is defined in this way, and you can implement these in different languages and have different strategies. <clears throat> and so... 
Let's, uh, let's hop in. Dump. Dump, dump. And so to get our two-way communication, I want to show you a really crude Okay, uh, and let me also uh, start up Phoenix. Yep, that's the truth, because <laughs> uh, I've got another Phoenix application running on the same port. <laughs> so let me close that one down. I knew I'd forget that. All right, so there we are. Phoenix is up and running, and uh, so we could talk uh, channels to it. And so let's see what's involved in channels uh, just at a really basic level. Let's understand kind of the protocol here. <clears throat> Okay, so we're going to use a uh, framework here that's a WebSocket framework. This would be nice if the whole thing was built up from the ground just where it's just straight F sharp. But, uh, but what we're going to do for now is we're going to play off of uh, that NuGet package for WebSocket sharp. We're going to open that up. Okay, and we're going to have a new WebSocket. We're going to set up a log message bit here. And we're going to open, we're going to set up some event handlers here off of that WebSocket thing. And this could be, of course, done a hundred different ways. But, uh, or uh, Scott Vlashin will talk about 13 different ways. Uh, he's going to be saying 13 different ways of looking at a turtle is a talk he's going to be giving. And one of the things I would love if, uh, so we, each day this week we're going to have a, a functional programming uh, lab hour, basically. So it's, F, it's at 3 o'clock each day, I think. And it's where all the speakers at the FP track come together and they're there for you for, you know, whatever questions you have, if you want to code on things together with someone, you have any just architectural idea, just whatever the conversation wants to be. And it's, it's really organic and free-flowing. Free but we could make a stab at if, if one table of people wanted to get together and work on implementations with Scott on, on different ways we would code the F-sharp client for Phoenix channels. But because uh, this is obviously not what you want to do, uh, you don't want to come in here and use this uh, NuGet package and say connect. And then, but but anyway, what this does is it gives us our uh, our protocol information. So we know that we're going to be sending, and we have a ref that's going to count up. Uh, the first message to join a channel. So you could think of this model as kind of like a chat room kind of model, or you could look at it as like topics on. Uh, message queues, that, that kind of thing. Uh, so we're going to join this topic. And so this code could be uh, like I'm, well, I, I won't get into that sidetrack. That, maybe they'll come up in a minute uh, about why you would use Phoenix, maybe with Phoenix channels with mobile apps. But, but let's talk about this, just what we have in front of us right now. Okay, so we send, we have this ref, which is just a unique ID. It can be a counter, it could be a GUID, it could be whatever. Uh, it's a string, but uh, we have the event that we're going to be using, and this is Phoenix join is the first one. We're going to pass this topic of rooms lobby, and then payload, we're going to send this. So let me go over here and open up a browser just so we can see what this thing is all about. Like, why are we... So here's the GUI uh, that was built up by Chris McCord on this Phoenix application that we're actually hitting right now. And so I'll say... Uh, Okay. All right, so uh, I timed out. That's why I had to reconnect there. So let me go ahead and, uh, uh, after so many heartbeats of not doing anything, if we don't respond, it'll go ahead and say, eh, you're out of here. 
So uh, I send my join, and you can see immediately I'm getting uh, information back. I'm getting this payload. It's got an OK response uh, from my join. And I get uh, a ping coming back from uh, the server, from, uh, basically from, from Phoenix there. OK, I'm going to send a new message to the topic, my user's boo, and I'm going to say howdy. So let's go over here and see, uh, see uh, that everyone saw us. And sure enough, we see that they're there. Let's see. OK, we are over here. We saw our two-way push that happened there, which is pretty neat, other than its console output. <laughs> uh, so that part's not exactly neat, but uh, we got our woohoo. And we're going to go ahead and say, uh, you know, we're out of here. OK, and so we hop out. OK, so that's, you know, that, that functions, and that gives us an idea of the raw view of this. Uh, it's not, it's, not, <laughs> it's not what we want. This is not uh, having our tools protecting us <laughs> from, from what we're dealing there. We've got strings, and we've got quotes, and all this horrible stuff. So we could implement this. Uh, I was thinking about the 13 ways of looking at a turtle post uh, by, by Scott. Uh, and, uh, you know, he has his, uh, his object-oriented view of things. And so we could have Phoenix model uh, is a type of channel, and we, we have these make messages and so on. We could also uh, go off and, uh, you know, start thinking about types on this thing. We could have our socket commands and our channel events and, and all this. And so we could build up and have a mailbox processor handling. And this is the way that feels most natural to me for this. But, but anyway, this is, I think, probably the path to build on. All right. All right. And we're getting kind of close, aren't we? Yeah, about five. Okay, so we could look at a RabbitMQ demo, but, uh, but all I'm doing is just proving that Rabbit works, and so I'll have the code uh, up on, uh, on GitHub, and so anyone can play around with Rabbit uh, there. So let's jump back into, uh, uh, into what, we're, what we're doing here. Uh, I have in the code, you'll also see this uh, thing called the Elixir Circus, and it's basically showing you a lot of... Uh, kind of cool, neat things that are built into, uh, I have to show you one. <laughs> uh, sorry. I want to show you something uh, inside of the Elixir Circus. Uh, so here's a FizzBuzz implementation. So this is FizzBuzz, and we see our implementation down here. We see pattern matching, which will it looks similar to something you might see in F Sharp, just a kind of a different syntax for it. But this is a cool bit. Is um, this demo is less about FizzBuzz and more about what we're seeing here? So in the middle of our documentation, see, we have two examples, and those two examples are doc tests. So what do I mean by that? And so CD, circus. Say so if I say mix test. So right off the, you know, I just hop into the root of this thing. I say mix test. And I see that I have two tests and one failure. And one of them is failing, saying FizzBuzz played 10 to 16 failed, where it expected a uh, uh, FizzBuzz there, but it got a Fizz instead. And that is here. Uh, that, that test that actually ran is right here in the documentation. F-sharp needs to steal this. We, we need doc tests. We need documentation in the REPL. We need, we need to pull these things over to F-sharp. This is just a brilliant thing. Of course, they stole this from Python. Uh, it's what J Jose and crew did, uh, for, uh, I, I believe. But it's a lot more relevant inside of a functional language because doc tests are basically testing things that don't have side effects, really. Because otherwise, you don't have teardown and setup inside of a doc, right? So this is going to be much more relevant to us as functional programmers than it ever was where it came from. And so F sharp needs this. <clears throat> okay, so that was the main thing I wanted to show you in the circus. There, there are a bunch of other cool things, but uh, but you can see a lot of those inside of that Elixir talk that I pointed at the beginning of the session. So I'll jump back in here, and we're close to our wrap up time now. Okay, to create front ends, and so.
this is not good, right? We don't, we don't enjoy this. As, as, you know, after we've been down the path, we don't want to go back in and work in JavaScript. And so we have this good story on Fable there. Same thing on mobile apps. Mobile apps are really, it's horrible. I mean, the work is just really crap. And, uh, and so if you're able to come in, and so we have a haiku here, mobile code is hell, right? As little as you can, F sharp for the win. And so this is, I think, the most compelling thing about Xamarin uh, is that they support F sharp and they brag about it. The thing I would love is everyone put Microsoft's feet to the fire and say, you need to invest a lot more in your F-sharp story because that is the reason you're relevant. Um, uh, like the reason that we are using Xamarin for what we do instead of Swift or going down isn't because of the cross-platform reuse. It's because of functional programming. It's because we can use F-sharp to target mobile devices. Uh, you know, it's not about I don't want to have to write two screens sort of thing. I mean, and that's the Xamarin story, but the F-sharp story is, I think, a much bigger, a bigger win. <clears throat> so, because you get this place where it's just a horrible place to write code, maintain code. Once you've deployed code that has bugs in it, you're screwed because you have the Apple review process that's like a week long and you've released this bug and all your customers hate you and they move on to something else and they never look at your app again. Well, you want to get it right at compile time and that's the thing that F Sharp can help you with. And once you've built this concise correct code, so there's not a whole lot of code on the device that you're having to deal with, and it's correct, you can have your gazillion users and you can then have it talking Phoenix channels back to the back. What we're doing is, is actually a little bit different than channels, but, but I think channels is actually the go-forward way. This is what needs, this story needs to be developed, I think. But we're using a, a little bit different implementation on what we're doing, but we'll probably migrate to channels. All right. So let's think about what can't be ported. Basically, things in the Erlang VM can't be ported. Okay. Uh, and so we're about to wrap up. The uh, Erlang VM is an operating system. You can't steal parts from the operating system and bring into F Sharp. So those we just have to leave and we have to use them as they are. There's an attempt at this with Akka. And so Akka just, blind, you know, just straight out says, yeah, we basically are stealing ideas from, from Erlang. And that's what Akka is all about. And, and, and it is a way of actually smoothing the experience as you're moving back and forth, just having your head being less yanked if you're going between Elixir and F-sharp. So you could use Akka.net with F-sharp. And there's actually an Akka talk going on right now, so you might want to watch that after the conference on the video. But, so that's, that's one way of where the idea was ported over. But you, know, you can't really steal all the good stuff uh, that was implemented in the VM there. Um, how do we get these dev joy bits, like the doc test and all that? Uh, you know, we're thinking about some of the things about how we get types coming back off of that F-sharp-X and the eval. We have F-sharp compiler services and we have Elixir metaprogramming. Those are the places for us to dig in and, and do our community work. So, so we have a different view than we came in here with. We probably had the view of just the fire breathing. Now we've got uh, nice bratwurst to go along with it. So uh, we can start thinking about how these problems tie in with just uh, everything that you think about, like in your architectural decisions. Now we can start plugging in, like, how would that work if? And so we've got another lens to see the problem with now. Whichever community you came in from, we've got a, a new lens now to look. So event sourcing. How would that work if you had F-sharp consumers? Uh, you know, how would it all play? Uh, Full-on CQRS, like which components could you break out? Which ones would make more sense? And this is where these ideas of decoupled sort of architectures are just beautiful because we get to do this work. Where um, on become better? The tooling lessons, calls to action. So here are the things. Uh, you know, this is what we all need to go off and build. Um, be beautiful to have type checking in Elixir and just basically call off to F sharp and have it create a, like a model of your code that you're passing it and type check. That could be, that could be done as a basically a compile step that called off to F sharp. Pretty cool. Uh, the idea of type providers to pull those back into Elixir, would, I would really appreciate that. <laughs> and, uh, you know, so these are things I'll be working on, but, uh, you know, ideally we'll have the whole community kind of poking around at this. Uh, doc tests for F sharp needs to happen. Um, 
This is one that uh, Robert Verding, one of the inventors of Erlang, uh, got him sort of interested in this, and this is the idea of, of porting F-sharp to the Erlang VM, in the same way that you could look at as Elixir being a port of uh, maybe a Ruby sort of thing. But here we have, if we have this statically typed language targeting the Erlang VM, that's a pretty interesting thing, because there's not one right now. And there's kind of reason that there's not one, but it's be an interesting project. Uh, types coming out of the F-sharp X thing we're looking at. Uh, make this thing solid, the Phoenix channels. And now we're at the spot of, uh, this is where you all need to be this week. <laughs> because this is, the, this is where the fun is. So in this, uh, today we'll be in room four all day. Uh, Sunny's coming up, uh, Dave Fancher's coming up, Scott Vlashen today. The workshops will be off in a workshop room. Uh, you can ask for directions there. But this is the lineup. And so uh, I hope to see you all in the FP track this week because there's just absolutely brilliant stuff. Uh, you can catch me on Twitter. And uh, vote on your way out. And next up is Dave Fancher, and he's giving the human version of this book right here. Uh, and uh, so he's, uh, he's back there, and he's going to give a 60-minute human talk version of that. And so uh, if there are any questions... <laughs> uh, if, does anyone have any questions, or are we ready to go ahead and just break for lunch? Because everyone's probably pretty hungry after all that talk of tacos. And, okay. All right. Well, thank you much. Oh, was there one? No. Okay. All right. Thank you much. Appreciate it.